Hey guys, today is going to be a different type of episode as I have a very special guest. My friend David has joined me today for an episode that I have been super excited to do. David, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure. And what what can you tell us about you? Well, my name is David Lundquist. I am a historian of uh, U.S. history. I have many years of uh, historical data, historical research, and have always had a fascination with history. Awesome. Well, <laughs> We're going to go real far into history today. So, <laughs> so guys, we are just going to start to jump right into this episode. What do swimming, touch, birthmarks, and prayer all have in common? I don't know. Well... Folks, if you guessed witch hunts, you'd be correct. Do you know anything about the origins of these? I do not. No? Well, apparently there were seven different ways that witch hunters, because that was a job, actually would look for a witch. One of those being the swimming test, where they would bind the victim and basically just throw them in a body of water nearby. If they sank, they were innocent. If they swam or floated, they were guilty. I don't know about you, but I would fail that test because I can swim. (laughs) I would as well. The prayer test was a medieval wisdom held that held that witches were completely unable to speak scripture aloud. So accused sorcerers were asked to recite something from the Bible, which was typically the Lord's Prayer. Mm-hmm. And they weren't allowed to make any mistakes. Again, I would probably fail at that because I would probably make a mistake here or there on that one. Unfortunately. The touch test was the idea that victims of sorcery would have a special reaction to physical touch with their aggressor. Okay. I had right. never heard of that until I started this research. That is the weirdest thing. The grossest one is the witch cake. The look on your face is like, <laughs> I don't know what this is and I don't know if I want to know. I didn't want to know after I found out. <laughs> Apparently, a witch cake is a supernatural dessert used to identify suspected witches. And witch hunters would take a sample of the victim's urine, mix it with rye meal and ashes, and then bake it into a cake. Then they would feed it to a dog or the witch's familiar And then they would try to get the dog to fall under a spell and point out who the the witch was. Okay. That poor dog. Now, I did know about this one. The witch's marks. Mm -hmm. Which is, basically, if you had a birthmark, you were a witch. Yeah. I've got all kinds of them, so I'm hurting. (laughs) (laughs) the pricking and scratching test was also a big one from witch hunters Um, if they didn't get anything from the marks from the birth marks then they would have 
the suspect be poked or pricked. And apparently witches, they, they decided that witches didn't feel pain and they wouldn't bleed. Richard would fail that test. Yeah. And then the last one was incantations. And it involved forcing the accused to verbally order the devil to let the possessed victim come out of their fit so that they could actually speak. Did you have any idea about any of these? I had uh, some knowledge of um, a few of them. Some of those were extremely new. Yeah, I, I, they were very new for me. I, the, the witch's cake is just so gross. Yeah, I, I, (laughs) again, olden day, olden times. Yes, yes. So if you guys haven't figured out yet, we're going to be discussing the infamous Salem witch trials of 1692. In what is now Danvers, Massachusetts. I feel like the entire situation was just unnecessary. Agreed. Uh, you know, I know a lot about this, you know, where the minority of people that, you know, mostly, you know, children, teenagers would be just accusing people left and right, either neighbors or people who they didn't trust and accusing them of being witches or warlocks in the case of men, because men were no exception to being accused. Oh, there were several accused in Danvers. Mm -hmm. And one in particular, I really, you and I had this discussion earlier today. I really feel like he was potentially... He had something going on. Cause oh, he, yeah. had, he had some superhuman strength there at the end. Yeah, you know, especially with, you know, his dying last words, you know, yeah. not ones that, you know, you would typically be wanting to say. Yeah. No. I'm sure we'll get into that further. Oh, yes. Yes, we will. That, that one in particular. <laughs> There were more than 200 men, women, and children accused of witchcraft. 30 were found guilty and 19 were executed. That doesn't mean only 19 died. Several died in jail Mm -hmm. because the jails were overpopulated. This went on for a little over a year Mm -hmm. and... It started in January and ended in May of the following year. Hmm. So, you know, it was overcrowding. They had to create a special court just for witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Because there was no way they could get to every trial. And all, like you said, all of the trials were based on claims from young girls that were claiming to be harmed by spells. Mm. Now, from what I have found in research, the first two girls who were nine-year-old Elizabeth Paris and her cousin, 11-year-old Abigail Williams, were actually practicing some voodoo. And they got caught by Elizabeth's dad, who was also the local minister. Mm -hmm. So that looks bad on the minister's Mm -hmm. family. And the girls blamed the Paris's slave, because it was the 1600s. Mm -hmm. Let's just call it what it was. She was their slave. Yeah. And she was from the Caribbean. And she never denied being a witch. No. In fact, you know, one of the main 
philosophies of it and from what we have gathered she actually admitted to um telling the girls you know stories of witchcraft and you know stories from back in her home in Barbados um of these you know witch stories and um she was teaching them voodoo, was she not? Correct. Uh, that you know, at least that's what she claimed in court. Because, you know, and there's some possibilities that, you know, she was coerced to, you know, admit it. You know, she was one of the only ones who, you know, admitted to being a witch. Um, well, I, I did read that... She was arrested along with the beggar, Sarah Good, and then the elderly woman, Sarah Osborne. Mm -hmm. And both of them denied being a witch. Correct. But it was so bad that Sarah Good's <laughs> four-year-old daughter was even arrested mm -hmm. for witchcraft. Which is insane. Mm -hmm. I have to agree. Now, they they claim that Tatuba, the the Caribbean slave, was being an informer. And telling them who all was practicing witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Who and was all in the, you know, in her group of, you know, you know, she was very, in the courts' eyes, she was very cooperative and, you know, pointing out who was, you know, active in witchcraft. And, you know, her testimonies were used in, you know, finding out who of the accused were actually, you know, to be sentenced. And then there were the upstanding, you know, upstanding citizens and Christians like Martha Corey and <coughs> Rebecca Nurse that were also accused. Mm -hmm. And Martha Corey, her husband is actually the one we were talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, Giles Corey, the only one who was... Killed in, you know, differently than the rest. Didn't he choose that? Yes. Why? He's the only male that was actually um, executed. And he chose, instead of hanging, to basically be buried by stone. Mm hmm Yeah, Give us uh, some detail on that. You know, and, you know, historians, you know, debate as to why he decided to go that route. Uh, basically, the punishment was where he would lay on a uh, slab of wood. There'd be another slab put on top of his body. And then... Uh, you'd have these large stones and these are not light stones. You know, they would take two, sometimes even three people to lift and put on. Uh, so more the, like a boulder? Yes. And um, all Jaws Corey could say and, you know, when they would try to get him to confess, you know, all he would say is more weight, more weight, you know. Typically, not something that while you're being crushed, you're going to keep saying. Now, he's also the same one that, if I'm not mistaken, he put a curse on the judge that presided over his case mm -hmm. and the sheriff. Mm -hmm. And y'all, the, the, they died, like, in the manner he said they were going to. Yeah. They, and not only them... But with the judge, 
it carried on in his family. Because if I'm not mistaken, he said it was going to take out his entire lineage. And mm-hmm. it pretty much did. Yeah. Uh, whether that's, you know, coincidence or not, historians debate on it. Um, in my personal belief, it wasn't, you know, a coincidence. <laughs> No, I, I actually, I agree with you on that one. Because how can you, right up until they put that last stone on his face, he survived. Mm-hmm. And that's just not, that's not humanly possible. No. Uh, like I said, these were not light stones or boulders. You know, they would take two to three people to put on So, now, I had read that they actually had, um, granted the families, what is it called, indemnities? Mm -hmm. What exactly is that? Uh, the state of Massachusetts, um, in 1992, so 300 years after the fact granted um, basically pardons for the uh, victims of the Salem Witch Trials. Now I did read in 1711 they paid the families mm. of the the trials. They mm. paid them um, for I guess pain and suffering mm-hmm. for killing their loved ones because Correct. they decided that the trials were unjust. You think? <laughs> I mean, you think? When we we throw around the word, you know, <clears throat> you know, going on witch hunt, or you know, sometimes it's claimed as a mass case of mass hysteria, you know, but you know, it's a wild goose chase, is what it is. Yeah. Um. To be fair, it was the 1600s. They didn't have forensics. They didn't have the ability to interrogate like they do now. Like they mm-hmm. didn't. They didn't know what to ask people. Well, again, you know, the people that were making the accusations were, you know, girls in the age range of nine to twenty. You know, and. That's like going to a high school and asking, you know, girls there, you know, making them basically point fingers at one another as to who is, you know, doing what, you know. Right. I mean, if we, if, if I don't have daughters, but I have friends that have teenage daughters and if, if we went every time that... Their teenage daughters would say that they were just the worst people in the world or they were evil or they were being mean. We'd never sleep. Mm -hmm. Because, and it's not just teenage girls, it's kids in general. Mm -hmm. Kids in general will tell you a story if it gets them out of trouble. And I feel like that is what started this entire situation. (laughs) Agreed. Yeah. (laughs) And historians agree as well. You know, it, it's more the case of this. And you have to also remember during this time, it was more in the belief of religious aspects um, rather than, you know, basing it on point of law. It was more, you know, what goes against the church. Well, also. What counted as a witch? If you were a single woman, Mm -hmm. if you were an old woman and you lived alone, Mm -hmm. if you were homeless, if you read too much, if you didn't read enough, if you didn't go to church, in this case, if you did go to church. Mm. So even the uh, minister at one point was accused of being a witch, you know. 
it's a very broad spectrum mm. of oh. of accounts who, of who is you know. Whereas <laughs> today it's more like you know, well, we have profiling down to almost an exact science where mm. we can tell who's going to be a serial killer or you know how how we're stopping a serial killer or that type of situation. Hmm. They didn't have that then. No. You know, and basically but, everything had to be taken at face value. Yeah. Well, they didn't... I, I honestly believe they didn't think that a Christian person would lie. Yeah. But it's, you know... And it, it's not... When it all comes down to it, it was just... These girls basically being mean Mm -hmm. and -hmm. just trying to get themselves out of trouble. Agreed. So, and it all, it all comes back to these, like, I think it was like five girls Mm -hmm. and there was, I had their names. The very first person that was actually convicted which she was tried, convicted, and executed, was Bridget Bishop. Mm. And then, after that, they just started hanging them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes three, four, or five at a time. Mm -hmm. And there's actually cases where, you know, couples themselves would be um, convicted, and we actually have record of kids actually being born in the jails. And then the entire families were mm. were killed. Correct. Which is so sad. Mm. It's just a sad situation. It really is. Mm. But it all, you know, this all came at the same time as it was all winding down overseas in England and in Europe and it you think that they would have learned from that and as as I say that I realize they didn't have television and they didn't have you know news traveled slowly and yeah they they didn't have air couriers and you know internet so they weren't able to communicate like we are now Mm -hmm. we get things so much faster now yeah And this is another reason why I always try to say, you know, when we go over these cases that are older, we have to remember they're older Mm -hmm. and we don't, we're looking at it from, from a bird's eye view. Yeah. And you and I have said it time and again, you know, hindsight, 2020. And it's, you know, I'm sure we were talking about another case the other night and that case in particular, you know, it was 44 minutes long and Mm -hmm. it was a shootout, which I'm going to, I am going to actually do that one. Um, but it, it was 44 minutes long and it was for the people involved. It was incredibly long. Mm -hmm. And I just can't even imagine a year of this going on. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, even some of the more recent cases that last, you know, only a couple of months, you know. It just drags on and on. It and just on. drags. And, and I, I just can't imagine, like, we've got to throw out a couple of cases that are going on right now here in, you know, locally. Mm-hmm. We've got the Crystal Rogers case. That's been going on since 2015. Yeah. I, that's got to be an eternity <laughs> for her family. Agreed. Yeah. And then you have... It took 300 years for these these people to be basically exonerated. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it's way too late. Yeah. I mean, I it mean, was too late when they put the noose on them. Mm-hmm. I just don't... Well, like you said, in 1711, it was too late because, you know, families have already... You know, gone past and, you know. Well, they they had talked about 
the um, it actually had started to people had started to lose interest in the trials by September. Mm -hmm. It started in January. By September, people were tired of it. Mm -hmm. So it started to just die down. Mm -hmm. And then... And it started to die down and, then, you know, the cases were coming in slower. And, you know, by May, you know, the courts were over with. You know, they dismantled the uh, assemblies and the magistrates who were assigned to these cases, they, you know, let them go, and um, they basically just cut it down by the end of May in 1693. They did not use a traditional gallows. No. They used a hanging tree. Mm -hmm. That tree still stands. Correct. And it is a landmark now mm. in Danvers. And it sits on a hill. Most of these buildings still stand mm -hmm. in Danvers. I have seen videos of people going to... Yeah. They call it. They still call it Salem, but it actually wasn't. There was two Salems. And they were actually fighting each other. Mm -hmm. They were in an argument. Mm -hmm. And after the trials the smaller town changed their name mm -hmm. to Danvers. Which I, I found to be fascinating because mm -hmm. they were trying to get away from it. Yeah. And it just brought in tourism and, mm -hmm. you know, all of this stigma, but also all of this history. Mm -hmm. And... History is fascinating, but it's also sometimes very sad. Mm -hmm. And then I, th I feel like this is one of those times when it's really sad. But Salem, Massachusetts, or Danvers, is on my bucket list. It is a place that I really want to go. Agreed, yeah. And yeah, it's a place that, you know, uh, Salem and... Um, that entire area is just filled with historical landmarks, historical uh, mm -hmm. places that, you know, all these different things happened. You know, the Salem Witch Trial, you have, you know, the city of Boston, you have all these different places, you know, that are just filled with history. You bring up Boston and it made me ask, uh, it's making me ask a question and I know I should know the answer, but this story bored me in history class, so I didn't remember the date. When was the Boston Tea Party? <laughs> was it around this time? <laughs> uh, the Boston Tea Party was, you know, a little more than a hundred years later. It was in the oh, I was way off. Yeah, it was in the seventeen seventies, uh, I believe. You know, just prior to the American Revolution. So about 80 years off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, I have enjoyed having you here for this. And hopefully we can do this again. Um, I am going to be doing what I'm calling spooky season all month of October. And for my last two episodes of October... My friend Brittany is going to be joining me as well. Um, but I have another episode that I would actually like for you to come back on, if you don't mind. I would like that. And let me pick your brain about that one. Okay. But guys, this wraps up our Salem Witch Trials. I mean, it's not, it's not pretty. And it's not... It's not fun. That that was... I feel like that's a little bit of an embarrassing time in our, our history. I really do. And like I said, I've enjoyed having David. And I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Let me know what you think. Remember to like, share, comment, follow, whatever. It's free to do that. 
I don't charge a subscription charge. And till next time, stay true and whatnot. Later.